Hi guys, welcome to another edition of MHI's Roundtable Discussions, where I'm gathered here today, as usual, with my brother Miguel, uh, our own very Dr. Rudy Evermind, and we bring you nothing short of the best today again, Mr. Ryan Smith. If you've ever heard of the word peptides, this man was almost single-handedly responsible for first putting them on the map in the health optimization space. Ryan noticed there were a few forward-thinking physicians who were treating age as an actual disease but they lacked the tools to accurately measure this process. So in that niche, Ryan felt a calling, left the success of TaylorMade, which was a huge one in 2020, and went on to create True Diagnostics. Through True Diagnostic, Ryan has created the largest private epigenetic database in the world with over 35,000 patients tested and created new and innovative algorithms to interpret methylation data, which can predict disease, diagnosis, inflammatory markers, aging pace, telomere length, cellular replication, and much more. Ryan is now in collaborations with Duke, Harvard, Yale, UCSF, Ohio State, and other Ivy League schools to uncover new insights in what we now consider aging to be a disease. So if the term anti-aging appeals to you, boy, do we have a treat for you today. <laughs> And Ryan, thank you so much for being here with us today. We feel honor and privilege. And, and I just want to take one moment to just honor you and congratulate you, man, and yeah. simply say we're proud of you. I mean, <laughs> at 32 years young, what a career, you know, to bring peptides first to us and now this. I mean, congrats, man. Yeah, congrats. Thank, you. thank you so much. It's a pleasure to always be talking to you. I remember from the peptide days, you were early adopters and now early adopters on this as well. So yeah. it's always great to work with uh, such innovative and forward thinking people. So glad to be here. Cool. All right. Yeah, and so, <laughs> so amazing. So again, I don't think you guys knew that about me. I did internal medicine as my specialty, but I also did geriatrics medicine, which is geriatrics. It's taking care of the elderly, of aging. And then now, as you said, the WHO now. The World Health Organization, WHO, is a specialized agency of the United Nations responsible for the international public health. It works to provide leadership on global health matters, shape health research agenda, set norms and standards, provide technical support to countries, and monitor health trends. The WHO also plays a key role in coordinating international responses to health emergencies and promoting overall health and well-being worldwide. Now, as you said, the WHO now classified aging as an extension of disease, as a, as a cause for disease, right? The code, the ICD-10 code is R54. As physician, it doesn't matter what I see on a patient. If I don't have a code, it doesn't exist. Yeah. Now there's a code for aging. Yeah. So our specialty, or, or it changed, right? Yeah. It used to be anti-aging. We don't like that term. Right. It's age management medicine, yeah. optimization medicine. But at the end of the day, what are we trying to do? We're trying to be the best version of ourselves. Father time is still unbeatable. It's still <laughs> going to get you. But are there ways that you can mitigate it, even reverse it? Absolutely. And Ryan kudos for what you're doing and bringing this to us. Yeah, so yeah. T tell us again about epigenetics. Yeah, so um, epigenetic methylation, um, uh, which I think we, we should get into uh, a little bit more specifically, uh, but but I think the bigger application is, as you mentioned, the importance of age, right? And and this is something that I think uh, has lagged behind in medicine for a long time. We always talk about preventive medicine and how to improve health by taking action early. Uh, but we always like to sort of mention that the biggest risk factor, period, the biggest risk factor for every chronic disease is age itself. Um, there's a reason that people in their 30s don't get disease as much, yeah. uh, much as people in their 60s, even with the exact same biomarkers, right? As a clinician, you could look at a 30-year-old with the exact same biomarkers and probably not be worried about all of the same outcomes you might be worried about if they were in their 60s. And so uh, fundamentally, that's the problem we're trying to solve. Let's have a way to measure that, that process. And, and the reason it's important is because we all know people in their 60s who look like they're 30, right? Or mm -hmm. the people in their 30s who look yeah. like they're 60. Yeah. And, and, uh, and you can't really go into a clinician's, uh, a patient's, and, and talk to them and say, I think that you're this age, so I'm gonna treat you like this. You really need ways to measure. Yeah. And so that's really, I think, uh, what we're really trying to do. Um, and some of the ways I always like to visualize it, and, and for anyone who's listening and, and watching, I like to show these types of graphs uh, that you might see on the screen. So these are the top three causes of death in uh, in the US for in 2020. So obviously in 2020, we had COVID-19, but cancer and heart disease are obviously the other two that are always up on that list. Mm. Um, and the reason I like to, to mention these is because we can see the relative risk contribution 
of age to things like obesity and smoking, right? right? These are things that you know you all probably counsel your patients on as absolute no's, right? Uh, get 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 those negative behaviors out. But they still pale in comparison to the relative risk of aging, um, and I think that just really puts it into perspective why this needs to be treated as the primary risk factor. If you are a healthy person, if you're a younger person, this is the number one marker I believe you should be testing because it, again, it is that biggest risk factor. And if you can mitigate the biggest risk factor, you can do a lot for your health. Yeah, and, and it's funny, you know, I'm, I'm the oldest here, right? I'm 53. And there's no question that old age sucks. There's no <laughs> question that as you get older, you start having pain, you start having nothing works the same. Can you help, you know, mitigate it, like yeah. reverse it? Yeah. But there's no question, and I like this, that aging is a risk factor for mm -hmm. all of those diseases. Absolutely. That's true. When do people get heart attacks? Mm -hmm. Unless you have some kind of genetic abnormalities. Mm -hmm. When do you get heart attacks, cancers, mm -hmm. degenerative disease? It happens with time, mm -hmm. with aging. And we like to say aging is a number, it's in your mind, mm -hmm. but the body does feel it. Mm -hmm. So I feel like now that we can say aging is a disease marker. So we, we don't need, you know, ageism. We, we don't want to discriminate Absolutely. against older yeah. people. Yeah. But if you realize, hey, no matter what you do, it's happening. Yeah. But now we can measure it and we can find ways to reverse it. Absolutely. And, and just to add to that, I think what's really interesting what you're doing, right? It's, you know, we, first of all, I remember reading, uh, uh, Sinclair's book a few years back uh, on what was it called? Yeah, Lifespan. Yeah. And he actually talked about this that age mm -hmm. would be considered a disease in time. And I remember you and I talking about yeah. it, ah, maybe it's a far off dream. <laughs> and now it's real. Yeah. Um, but the other thing is a lot of people, when it comes to their health, they, you know, they become victimized mm -hmm. and they say, well, it's my genes mm -hmm. or I'm predisposed to this or my family had this. Now mm -hmm. with this, we can actually measure it, yep. track it, and you can actually implement different lifestyle applications where you can actually correct this stuff mm -hmm. and not be sort of predestined to yeah. to, to to death or that disease right. because your parents had it or because your genes have it. Now exactly. you can actually interact yeah. with it. No, and I think one more thing that we definitely need to add is that for every year that we're alive, the longevity escape velocity. A scientific process that is extending human lifespan faster than aging through longevity escape velocity. Advancements in medicine and technology will soon enable real-time tracking of genetic, microbial, and chemical aspects, optimizing our health and potentially surpassing mortality limitations. For every year that we're alive, the longevity escape velocity, meaning yep. that we're getting to a point that in the next five to 10 years, if you can hold on, will exceed the rate of aging with yeah. uh, reversing the aging, right? Yeah. Which is called the longevity escape velocity, if I'm not wrong. Absolutely, yeah. And and I think that, um, you know, that that's uh, that's the, the really big target for everyone, right? If we right. can start to reverse aging faster than we are aging, right. then that means we can have population increases that are incredible. But I also want to bring it back down to the now, the now, right? I think that yeah. the longevity escape velocity is super exciting. I mean, that's what everyone's shooting for. But at the same time, I like to show some statistics about just how much this means to us as a country, us as a, a, a nation. Uh, you From know, an economics perspective, which is it, a super exactly. interesting argument. Yeah, and, and so the, the, the statistics, one I, uh, Morgan Levine, a very famous epigenetic researcher said, is that if everyone in, were to cut their biological age by just seven years, we would cut the incidence of disease in half. 50% wow. of people would no longer be sick. Wow. And I mean, if you can think about how that plays a role uh, in our economy and in uh, uh, everything that we do on a daily basis, uh, mm -hmm. that's a really important statistic. If everyone were to increase life expectancy by just one year, the U.S. health economy would save $256 billion wow. um, just by one year of life extension. And so that's really our goal, right? This, these, these things are, even with moderate increases, where we're not talking about, you know, living 50 or 60 years longer, yeah. we're talking about one year. Mm -hmm. We could save trillions uh, in our healthcare spending. And that's a way to maybe fix some of these problems we have by really focusing on preventative medicine, mm -hmm. Rather than just having people go to physicians when they get sick. Right. Um, and so that's, I think, the other big piece of this is it, it brings preventive medicine to the forefront. Um, and by the way, by the time you get to an actual physician to treat the disease, you might have been 10 years late. Exactly. Which with yeah. this, you can actually catch it way yeah. in advance. It's kind of like the hurricane in Africa that we can see from here from Florida. Yeah. <laughs> exactly. And we'll, we'll talk about that, I think, too, because, uh, you know, we have the rates of aging, which are more instantaneous. And then overall biological age, which is the you know, sort of what's happened throughout your entire life. 
life. And, and there's some things you can't change, right? Like, uh, you know, adverse childhood experiences, socioeconomic status, those right. actually things increase aging. Right. So it also brings this, uh, this big idea of, you know, how do we set up the world uh, to, to really treat aging as a primary outcome and then have uh, improvements across the board. So w one thing I want us to do, because we're throwing all those big terms, mm -hmm. I want to be sure that the audience know what we're talking mm -hmm. about genes versus epigenetics absolutely right so when we think about it it's only recently that they they were able to decode mm -hmm. the human genome and we have all that information the human genome project which aimed to decode the entire human genome was completed in april 2003. this monumental achievement provided a comprehensive understanding of the structure and function of the human dna it's only recently that they, they were able to decode mm -hmm. the human genome and we have all that information. Absolutely. But the science of epigenetics, right, above mm -hmm. the genes. Mm -hmm. I love that saying where it says the genes load the weapon, mm -hmm. but the environment, the epigenetics pull the trigger. Mm -hmm. So you can have the genes. If you change the environment, mm -hmm. you're not necessarily going to be subject of what the gene was coding for. Exactly. And I think the science of epigenetics, it's really important for us to really say that. Mm -hmm. It's as you were saying, Carlos. So once somebody says that I'm no longer a victim, mm -hmm. there's something I can do to change the epigenetics. Yeah, can, can you go over that a little bit? Please? Definitely. And and, and uh, yeah, the self-control aspect, the ability to control your own destiny, empowering. I think absolutely empowering, yeah. right? It's uh, And don't get me wrong, there's still predispositions, but yes. what we're really talking about is, is what genes are turned on and off. A little bit like the hardware versus software. But every single cell on our body has the exact same DNA, right? Mm -hmm. Your heart, your liver, your brain, they're all the exact same DNA sequence, but they behave very differently, right? Mm -hmm. Your heart is it got a, a remarkably different uh, uh, expression of functionality. genes. Functionality. Yeah, <laughs> functionality. Yeah, 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 like that phenotype. A phenotype refers to the observable traits or characteristics of a person's organism, which are influenced by the genetic makeup, genotype, and environmental factors. For example, in humans, eye color, height, and hair type are all examples of phenotypes. <laughs> yeah, functionality. Yeah, 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 or like that phenotype, right? How it actually, what actually happens versus your brain. And the question is, if we have the same DNA, how are we having such remarkably different specialization of t cells and tissue? Um, and the answer is by what genes are actually turned on or turned off. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, there are many, many different ways that we could do this. I, you know, I put some helpful graphics for anyone watching about the many different types of epigenetic changes. But the one that we're looking at, and the one that's been really studied the most in epigenetics, is DNA methylation. DNA methylation methylation is like a tiny tag that tells your cells which genes to use and which to ignore, optimizing how your body works. It's a bit like adding a note to a recipe, telling you how much of each ingredient to use. This process helps your body know when to grow, when to heal, and even helps determine your hair and eye color. In the future, understanding DNA methylation could help doctors customize medicine and treatments for each person, making healthcare more effective. But the one that we're looking at, and the one that's been really studied the most in epigenetics is DNA methylation. And this is sort of the off switch. So what generally happens is most people know we have A, C, T's, and G's in our genome, right? Uh, but those C's, those cytosines that happen in that sequence, whenever they have a methyl group attached to them, they basically turn off. Uh, the transcription machinery that makes RNA really can't attach to the genome, um, which means that we're stopping the expression of that gene. Um, and, and that information can be very valuable. So when we're doing this testing, what we're really measuring is in about a million locations on your gene, what is the percentage of methylation and therefore approximately the percentage of activity. Um, and we can read those patterns in, in a lot of different ways. Uh, chronological age has always been the main application, but we can uh, predict death highly accurately. We can tell you how much you've smoked across an entire lifetime. We can tell you about your disease, uh, pollution exposures, and maybe even where you, your, what zip code you've lived in most of your life based on even particulate matter in the air. Wow. So it can be used for a lot of different things and it is a growing biomarker. Um, you know, if, if anyone has paid attention to genetics over the past 24 years, uh, it's been a extremely fast um, and, and progressive field. But epigenetics has to do something, um, yeah, yeah, a growth similar to that is actually even anticipated to overtake blood testing in the next 15 yeah. years wow. because of all the things we can tell from just a single drop of blood. Um, and so, yeah, we're really excited about it, but that's what we're talking about, gene expression, but particularly looking at the off switches on your DNA um, and how we interpret that for a variety of health outcomes.